In unit two, we're going to talk about the four types of tissues. Specifically, we'll talk about epithelial, connective, muscle, and neural tissue. Tissues are collections of cells and cell products that perform specific limited functions. Looking at this diagram, we see that cells can secrete and regulate for our body and produce extracellular material and fluids. Cells combine to form tissues with special functions. Tissues combine to form organs, and organs have multiple functions. And organs interact in the organ systems. If we look at the specific four types of tissue, starting with epithelia, epithelia is responsible for covering exposed surfaces, it also lines internal passageways and chambers, and it produces glandular secretions. Connective tissue fills the internal spaces of your body. It provides structural support, and it also stores energy. Muscular tissue is responsible for contracting to produce active movements, and neural tissue conducts electrical impulses, so it carries information. We're going to start with specifically talking about epithelial tissue. Our characteristics of epithelia is that it has tight cell junctions. Those junctions allow for communication. They are polar. They have apical and basal surfaces. And they also have attachment. Finally, they are able to regenerate. So epithelial tissues provide physical protection. They control permeability. They produce specialized secretions. We call these glandular epithelium. Epithelial cells also support and communicate. CAMs, cell adhesion molecules. These are responsible for allowing material to transport or be transported between cells. Transmembrane proteins are structures that span the width of the biological membrane, and they often function as a gateway for the transport of substances between cells. Our um, cells also have intercellular cement. Proteoglycans are materials that fill the spaces between cells. They act as a glue substance. Hyaluronan is a fluid that is secreted by the cell, and it provides compression strength. Glycoaminoglycans have a primary role to maintain and support collagen. So they help the elastin and the turgidity in cellular spaces. Our cells also have cell junctions. There are three major types of cell junctions, tight junctions, gap junctions, and desmosomes. As we've already heard this week, epithelium plays a role in lining different parts of the body. For the epithelial cells that make up your skin, this means keeping the contents of your body on the inside and separated from the rest of the world on the outside. So separating the inside of your body from the outside of your body or separating one different environment from another different environment is a very important function of an epithelial cell, but it can't do it alone. To form an effective barrier, lots of epithelial cells need to form a barricade with no gaps between the cells. Cell junctions are found between adjacent epithelial cells and like the name suggests, make sure that these cells are tightly adhered to one another. There are three main types of cell junctions that we're going to be talking about today. Tight junctions, as the name suggests, which firmly adhere adjacent cells to one another. Desmosomes, which further strengthen these tight junctions and are resistant to stretching and twisting. And gap junctions, or these are junctions which are called communication junctions, allowing adjacent cells to talk to one another. Now, just like its name suggests, tight junctions tightly connect adjacent epithelial cells to each other. This is achieved by fusing the plasma lemma of adjacent epithelial cells, which form an impenetrable barrier. The function of tight junctions is to form a seal 
that prevents molecules from passing between the two cells. That way, anything on the luminal side has to pass through the cell rather than between the cell. The epithelial cell also acts as a security guard, choosing what passes from the luminal side into the body, or what passes from one side to the other. Tight junctions can be found in the epithelium that lines your intestine. As you can see in this diagram, when there are tight junctions present, bacteria are unable to pass between the cells and enter the body. If we didn't have these tight junctions, then the cells would not be tightly held together, and the bacteria would easily be able to pass between them and enter the body. Desmosomes are the second type of cell junction, and these function to firmly adhere and strengthen the bond between cells. Desmosomes strengthen the connections of adjacent cells. They are found just under or next to tight junctions and are formed by proteins that interlock and connect the cells. So if my hand represents a tight junction, desmosomes are like my interlocking fingers which firmly keep the junction together and are resistant against stretching and twisting. Desmosomes are found between epithelial cells that need to withstand physical stress, such as the skin. So if I scratch or rub my skin, it's the desmosomes that are holding these adjacent cells together that prevent them from falling apart. Gap junctions are the third type of junction we're going to talk about today. These are found between adjacent cells and allow these cells to communicate effectively with one another. Proteins called connexins form small channels that allow ions and small molecules to move back and forth between the cells. These channels allow messages to pass between cells, allowing them to communicate and coordinate functions, like helping cilia of adjacent cells move together. So just to recap what we've covered in this lesson, there are three types of cell junctions. Tight junctions, which firmly adhere adjacent cells to one another to form an impenetrable barrier. Desmosomes, which further strengthen these tight junctions and make them resistant to stretching and twisting. And finally, gap junctions, which enable cells to communicate effectively with one another. This image shows a tight junction. Also below it is an adhesion belt. Tight junctions are, again, meant to keep materials out of the intercellular space. This image shows a gap junction, where materials can be transported to and from cells next to one another. This image shows a desmosome. There are two types of desmosomes, a spot desmosome and a hemidesmosome. So hemidesmosomes anchor the cell to um, the basement layer underneath. Spot desmosomes anchor cells to one another with cell adhesion molecules. Here is an image of a hemidesmosome anchoring the cell to the basement layer. On the surface of, of epithelial cells, we will find microvilli and cilia. Microvilli and cilia increase the surface area of the cell, thereby allowing materials to be exchanged from the external environment or into the cell much easier. Epithelial cells are replaced by division of stem cells. And typically, this occurs near the basal layer. In order to classify epithelial cells, we need to look at the shape and the number of layers. There are two types of epithelium, singular epithelium and plural epithelia. Our classes of epithelia include simple epithelium, and these are single layers of cells, and stratified epithelium, which are several layers of cells. We also categorize based on shape. The first shape for epithelial cells is squamous epithelia. 
These are thin and flat. They look very similar to an egg on a frying pan. There's cuboidal epithelia. And these are square shaped or cube shaped. And finally, columnar epithelia are tall, slender rectangles. Here's an image representing each of these. Our simple squamous epithelia. Simple cuboidal epithelium. And simple columnar epithelium. All three of these different types of epithelia are simple because there is only one layer. Our stratified epithelia still includes squamous, cuboidal, and columnar, but they occur in layers. You will notice at the surface we can see the squamous cells very distinctly. In stratified cuboidal epithelium, they're stacked one on top of one another, all retaining the cuboidal shape. And in stratified columnar epithelium, we'll notice the surface layer is very columnar in shape. The underlying layers may be similar to cubes. Simple squamous epithelial cells can be found in a number of areas of the body, including the ventral body cavities. They line the heart and blood vessels, along with portions of kidney tubules. Their functions are to reduce friction and control vessel permeability. So this helps to relate to the job of absorption and secretion. Cuboidal epithelial cells can be found in glands and ducts, including portions of the kidney tubules and the thyroid gland. They have limited protection functions. They are responsible for secretion, and they are also responsible for absorption. Our simple columnar epithelia a lot of times will contain microvilli along the top. Their locations are in the lining of the stomach, intestine, gallbladder, uterine tubes, and collecting ducts of the kidneys. Their functions include the protection, secretion, and absorption of substances. We also have stratified squamous epithelium. Their locations are at the surface of the skin. They line the mouth, throat, esophagus, rectum, anus, and vagina. Notice we can see in the stratified layer, the top layer is very squamous in shape. The stem cells would be found at the basement membrane, and these cells would replace any damaged or lost cells at the surface. They provide protection against abrasion, pathogens, and chemical attack. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium cells usually have cilia along the top, they are found lining the nasal cavity, the trachea, and the bronchii, and portions of the male reproductive tract. Their functions are protection and secretion. Transitional epithelium can be found in the urinary bladder. It can be found in the renal pelvis of the kidneys and the ureters. Its function is to permit expansion and recoil after stretching. So in this image, we see two states, the relaxed state and the full state or stretch state of the bladder. In the relaxed state, the epithelial tissue may look very cuboidal. In the stretched state, the surface epithelium may look very squamous in shape. Epithelial cells are also responsible for secreting hormones. They work like glands. Exocrine glands 
They produce secretions onto epithelial surfaces, and this usually occurs through ducts. There are a number of mechanisms of secretion. The merocrine secretion is produced in the Golgi apparatus, and it's released by vesicles through the process of exocytosis. Uh, sweat glands are an example of this type of secretion. Apocrine secretion is produced in the Golgi apparatus as well, and it's released by the shedding of the cytoplasm. Mammary glands are an example of this. And then holocrine secretions are released by cells that burst. It kills the gland cell. Gland cells are then replaced by stem cells. An example of this type of secretion is the sebaceous gland uh, within a hair follicle. Some glandular cells are classified as merocrine glands because after products are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum, they are processed by the Golgi and then released through exocytosis. Most glands in the human body are merocrine glands, such as the salivary glands, the glands of the pancreas, and the eccrine sweat glands, which release the watery sweat for thermoregulation. Apocrine glands release a portion of the cytoplasm, which is pinched off from the apical portion of the cell. There are glands known as apocrine glands in humans, which produce the type of sweat which results in body odor. And mammary glands were considered to be modified versions of this type of sweat gland. Recent research has called into question whether true apocrine sweat glands exist in humans and whether the glands formerly known as apocrine sweat glands in humans should better be classified as merocrine glands. So this will require further study. In glands classified as holocrine glands, dividing cells synthesize a number of products, and then the entire cell ruptures, and it is the contents of the cytoplasm then which constitute the secretion of this gland. The sebaceous glands which secrete sebum are holocrine glands. Here we see each of these examples, the merocrine secretion, the apocrine secretion, and the holocrine secretion. We can see the step-by-step -step process that is responsible for the releasing of different materials in each of these images A, B, and C. There are a couple of different types of secretions that epithelial cells will have. The first one is serous glands. These are watery secretions. The second is mucosus glands. These secrete mucins. And then we have mixed exocrine glands that will release both. Here's a classification of exocrine glands. So we see each of the different types, merocrine, apocrine, and holocrine secretions, and how they go about being released. And then we see examples of each one of those as well. Finally, our three different secretion types, a description of each one of them, and then examples of each one.